We're cooking quinoa. We're gonna start over on the counter and I'll talk you through it. Quinoa is something that I like to have for dinner um, every chance I get. Shapiro and I represent <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was the one on cold medicine <laughs> are we just playing off like my energy of being delirious and sick yes uh, anyway welcome this is to the, the spectator, spectator film, film podcast, podcast. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everybody uh yeah, hi. So I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And <laughs> we're talking about, if you can't tell about our tell the hilarious film Eraser Head yes. by David Lynch. And you know what? That was actually the perfect segue. Because you know what? David Lynch has talked about this many times. I don't know if it's his favorite movie, but one of his favorite movies is The Wizard of Oz. So Max, really, you're really like in the zone right now. I didn't bring up <laughs> that was you. <laughs> nice, nice self compliment there, Austin. <laughs> Whoever brought up the Wizard of Oz is just great and attractive and Max the mind behind this podcast. Max, listen. We're moving on. <laughs> uh so yes, today we're doing a racer head. Uh who ch- wait, who chose this? You. This is the second week in a row. We don't know who chose this. No, you chose this one hundred percent. You were all about that lynch. About that lynch. No. Well, not, I'm not going to fight you over it, but the uh, point is we've been wanting to do David Lynch for a long time on the show. I think uh, despite how angry that would make him, we, David, you're not listening to this. But if he was, we would know that he would be David mad at us for talking about his movie. listener, Neil Gaiman. We don't know about that. Yes, of course, as we all know. No, Neil Gaiman's probably busy. Is that Good Omen show out now? Sure. So. Um, no, he's not busy on that. He's just getting a paycheck. He's I, busy spending that money. Is no, but he's responding to like every fan criticism of the show online right now so that I don't know why he's brought that up on himself when he could just be like, I just signed the deal to let them make it. Leave me alone, please. So yeah. The only way you could be, I mean, I'm not even going to speculate on what's causing him to do that. <laughs> somebody holding him a gunpoint or something. Um, somebody getting sadistic answer the trolls on the internet. Do it for me. <laughs> but no, that situation aside, good luck, Neil. Um, we've been wanting to do David Lynch for a long time. Uh, despite him getting mad about people talking about his movies, we felt like it would be a fun challenge to do. And I think this is definitely going to be a challenge to do this movie. However, I think our approach we're going to take with it this week is, uh, we're going to go for like a simple approach and then intellectualize on top of that, because I think that you can definitely intellectualize this movie, but I think people overcomplicate how this movie works without, necessarily having to and i think uh as as bizarre and strange as this movie is and how much it sort of deserves its title as being a classic midnight movie uh i think it's much more accessible than people give it credit for and if you haven't watched any david lynch movies which i can't imagine would be the case if you've if you're listening to this right now because you searched Racerhead on podcasts um i'm gonna say that this is still a solid point to begin with, even though his career has many different movements and many different changes. And ultimately this movie isn't quite the type of movie that he would be making for the majority of his career. However, it does really introduce the same sort of style of artistic independence. And, um, I'm going to say elliptical narrative and, uh, emphasis on tone and use of fantasy throughout his movies that you see throughout the rest. Um, so yeah, uh, I can't remember. I actually can't remember what my experience. Okay, first well time then I'll this. start. Yeah, you go. I'm just going to start with my experience of David Lynch as a whole. Yeah, because dude. I think I'm slightly unique in this aspect where I love Eraserhead. I saw it for the first time when I was I want to say 19. I it was a little late, honestly, but I watched it in film school. And unlike a lot of the movies they forced us to watch, where I'm just like, okay, whatever, this is bullshit against my better judgment a lot of the time, but I was instantly enthralled with this movie. I mm-hmm. loved it. I had seen wild at heart before, but oh, that's a weird one. Yeah. To begin with. I just, I, I think that I just like come on and I saw, I didn't like actively seek it out, but 
I'm not the biggest fan. Like, I haven't seen a lot of David Lynch things. Like, I think I'm the only person in existence who hasn't seen Twin Peaks. Like, Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Take that, internet. Um, and, Please don't yell at us. Yeah, and at this point, like, I don't want to because <laughs> <laughs> every, like... I know this is stupid, but when you get to the effective override of like, everybody's like, no, you need to watch this. It's the best thing fucking ever made. How have you not seen Twin Peaks? I can't believe you. You need to watch Fire Walk with me. It's a little bit of a mix, but it's fine. And then another reboot series, you know, it takes place 30 years later because at the end of the Twin Peaks, they say it's going to see you in 30 years and then it's 30 years later and they did it. And wow, it's amazing. <sighs> Calm down. I, I'm probably not going to watch it at this point, but I love Eraserhead. Um, I've seen this more than any of his other films by far. And I always enjoy it whenever I watch it, which is a weird thing to say about a movie that is just utterly fucking like miserable and sad and dark for the majority of it. It takes place in just like all these filthy sets that are just lonely and you mean America 2025. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Thanks. I saw some tweet. It was just like old dystopian movie used to be like America 70 years in the future and Neo New York City and now they're just like next Wednesday yeah yesterday <laughs> don't you remember this oh god but yeah uh, I'm not gonna go too much into my analysis of this movie but I fell in love with it when I first saw it I have rewatched it I'm trying to think I can't keep an actual tally but like I'm probably in the double digits of rewatching this movie at this point. So then let me ask, how would you, if you had to rank the David Lynch movies you've seen or, or just what you might say? Oh your God, favorite don't is? do this to me. Um, what, so we've got Eraserhead, Elephant Man, Dune, Blue Velvet, Wild at Heart, uh, Twin Peaks, Fire Walk With Me, which you haven't seen. Yes. Um, then we've got uh, Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, and Inland Empire. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to do... <laughs> so I think Blue Velvet's probably my favorite. Okay. Um, this is a close second. Uh, Mulholland Drive probably after that. Uh, and I'm going to say Dune just because it's such a <laughs> fucking what the fuck is this? <laughs> Dune is an experience and not in the same way of this is. It's just like, wow, what? It, like, look at these visual metaphors and what does this mean? Dune is a what the fuck happened in this movie and why would you get David Lynch to adapt to this? Um, but you don't like Sting? <laughs> not really no <laughs> come on man if you can't come after 16 hours you need to call your doctor <laughs> you don't need to keep going <laughs> but, oh boy do you think he was recording a podcast and then elephant man after that but yeah <laughs> right so uh yeah that's hmm i'm not sure what my order would be i would definitely say that eraser head is not necessarily my favorite either i'd say my favorite is probably lost highway or, or blue velvet and then maybe eraser head Maybe not even a racer head at third. Um, at any rate, I think this is still definitely a, a really good movie. Um, and I think the first time I watched this was uh, was well after I was aware of David Lynch already, and I had seen a number of his movies. I think I had watched this like a significant portion of time after I had already seen Mulholland Drive, Lost Highway and Blue Velvet. I think there was the first several three that I watched. And I may have even watched Inland Empire before this, which is definitely a weird one. Um, but yeah, so I, I think this movie sort of gave me the same impression that I had already gotten from David Lynch a lot, um, even though I really do think it's quite different from a lot of his other stuff in many significant ways, um, just in terms of the way he's he organized it and the way he thinks about it in terms of being a movie. I think he wasn't so much like a, like a specific filmmaker, at this point, so much as he was like an artist, right? And I think that informs his decisions creatively. Um, and then those artistic tendencies grew into sensibilities that became more like in tuned with film specifically and like a self-aware, I think, as he goes along. But uh, definitely, I think this movie is a good jumping off point if you are if you haven't seen oh, any Oh, no, it's his first movie. Um... Well, his first feature movie, yes. you should say. Okay. Um, a lot of people will talk about his shorts and how awesome they are. So still like it. Okay. It's his first feature length film. Um, I have to say though, cause I didn't associate him with wild at heart, even though I had seen that beforehand. So when I knew him as like this crazy surrealist visionary director, uh, just through popular culture and osmosis, then I saw a racer head and I was fucking psyched. I'm just like, Oh God, we're going to get more and more of this. 
his movies are surrealist, but this like I think you said this. This isn't an amazing indicator of what his movies are going to be like. Right. Especially because you have the interruption. Yeah. Sort of, right? Where he does the big Hollywood I think Elephant Man is a good movie, but he's clearly taking a type of Hollywood type of story and he's applying his sensibility to it. And then Dune is just kind of a clusterfuck, yeah. right? It's a studio clusterfuck. So really, this movie comes out in 1977 and it's almost like a 10-year interruption before you go back to that like sort of auteur-ish type of control he has over his movies with Blue Velvet. And by that point, his style has evolved quite a bit, I'd say, even though you can find many connections between them, as I'm sure we'll notice while we're watching this movie during the commentary. But yeah, it's interesting you point that out. Because, again, it, it is quite different. Um, I do love it, though. Um, if anybody wants to get me a shirt that has the lady in the radiator and says in heaven everything is fine, uh, I keep having trouble finding versions of those that aren't sold out. So send it to our P.O. box. The, get him a really small one for women, though. Does yes. that be funny? Get, get, me, get me a crop top and... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> It's a fashion idea that I want to see try. It's just like a crop top that says you are not immune to propaganda and then booty shorts that say propaganda on this. <laughs> well, that's certainly interesting. You should try that sometime. I sure. will. I'll, I'll wear that to our next podcast. Although I want to give everybody a warning. Okay. Listen. That will be the first one where we have a full body cam for the podcast. I mean that too. But listen, if you watch this, if you're going to watch this movie along with us, David Lynch is already mad at you because he doesn't want you listening to a commentary track by watching this movie. We all know his persona. He doesn't want to talk about his movies. And I think that's justified because no, he doesn't have to, first of all. And second of all, I think his movies are added by the um, sort of experience of having to figure it out on your own. Second of all, if you're watching on your iPhone, he's going to yell at you. you. You know what, Max? If you're watching this movie on your iPhone while listening to us, you know what you got to do? David Lynch will like appear behind you and stab and he's gonna, you in the face. He's going to creep up behind you, <laughs> right up to your ear, and then he's going to go, get, get real. <laughs> get real. He's going to yell it in your ear. So everybody, don't do that. Max, are you ready to watch this movie on our iPhone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me just turn the brightness all the way up real quick. Get uh, real. <laughs> get real. Oh, my God. David, no, put the knife down. <laughs> 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 All right, everybody. And we should mention that we are going to be watching the Criterion version of this movie. Which means I get to be like, yo, hashtag Criterion hates the hearing impaired because yet again, this one does not have subtitles. You know what I've realized, though, about that is I actually have not checked the box 100% every time we've done it looking for those. I assume it would be in the disc menu, but it could be a function on the Blu-ray. But then again, if it's not on the disc menu, that's still confusing. Yeah. So make it less confusing at the very least. And I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt that might also not exist. So we'll we'll see everybody. Well, there are people who are just like, oh, well, you can't have subtitles because it's going to be covering part of it and it's ruining. You should be paying 100% attention. Are you talking about David Lynch? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, if I was I talking about David Lynch, that. I'd be like, come on. Get real. Um, Make sure you adjust every setting on your TV. Oh, so that's a fun great. game to play. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, this is the only Blu-ray version of this movie. As far as I can tell, that's available for purchase in the US. So anyway, so we have this... Incredible prologue sequence, Max. Now, if we think like, which I think we do sometimes. Sometimes. When we watched this movie for the first time, we were probably thinking like, this is some sort of metaphor for sex, right? And he, he's going to like, then vomit up this little spermy dude. Well, yes, that's, that's the egg. And then there's a sperm. Yes. This, I think, is perhaps sort of true. But I think that the actual goings on of this prologue sequence are a little bit more sophisticated. And this is where we jump into Lacan a little bit. I'm not going to be quoting Lacan directly throughout this entire episode, but I will be linking to some stuff in the show notes. Um, I'm also using a book for reference, The Impossible David Lynch. At any rate, I was taught in college to look at David Lynch movies through the lens of Lacan, and I think they lend themselves to that uh, sort of perspective and, and interpretation. So what we begin here with, let's connect it to our idea from our Tank Girl episode, right? Where the idea of water in that movie is something that is non-regulated. <laughs> okay. And it is like 
not being able to be pinned down, right? It's amorphous, kind of. David Lynch, who we've tied in the corner after he tried to stab us before that yes. <laughs> intro, he's really wrangling around now that we're Don't comparing his him. movie to Tank Girl. Yes. Um, no, he loves Tank Girl. Uh, but at any rate, that's sort of what Jack Nance is doing at the beginning of this movie. He's in this indefinite state. He's amorphous, right? He is not tied down in any way. But what's about to happen here is that we're going to get this shot that's creeping up on this planet. Um, looks beautiful, of course. And what we're going to see soon is we're going to see production designer Jack Fisk, one of the best ever, right? Um, he's this man who's going to pull on the levers. And that's when the little spermy thing comes out of Jack Nance's mouth. Now, how does this relate to Lacan and a Lacanian reading of this movie? Lacan would relate this moment to the idea of when a a young mind, a child, is entering into language. Do you want to talk it. to people who might not know who Lacan is? Lacan was a theorist and psychoanalyst who was uh, popular in France in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and was a big player in like the structuralist uh, theories that became really popular in the U.S. around the 70s. Um, it, he's just a psychoanalyst. One of his big things was rereading Thro- Freud. So he may he took Freud's ideas and made them a little bit more sophisticated in many ways. Correct. <laughs> well, I don't think actually it, his or Freud systems are entirely very useful for like interpreting real life. Yeah. But in terms of looking at like organizing the way movies work, <laughs> I think they're kind of interestingly effective sometimes. Not that it's a requisite you have to understand Lacan to get the great fucking <laughs> mystery of how movies work. But at any rate, I think you it's beneficial. Tetsuo the Iron at, Man right here. Yes, Jack nice. Fisk. Um, who happened to be married to uh, Sissy Spacek. Ooh. And both of whom contributed a lot of money to this movie to help it make make it successful. So again, he's going to open his mouth and then this thing comes out. Now, specifically in this book, Peter McGowan on David Lynch writes that this is the lamella, which is an even more specific part of this process that Lacan goes into. But essentially the idea is that when you exist in this indefinite, unregulated space as a young child, right, you don't know boundaries yet. You wouldn't be able to differentiate one part of your body from like an object, right? But in that, there's a sort of freedom. You know what I'm saying? You are unregulated. However, the moment you start to learn language, that changes, We can connect this to the idea from 1984 in George Orwell, where he's talking about how you can eliminate an idea by eliminating the word for it. Same thing goes for introducing ideas. And since ideas and words are things that have solid limits, those are regulated. Once I know I am Austin, I know I am not that book over there. You know what I'm saying? There's now because... There's restrictions in speech. Yes. Inherently. Speech is a system of rules. Well, it's right? like <sighs> it's a logic that is impressed upon your mind. And in order to the thing is, though, that's the only way you become a conscious subject. Yeah. Well, there's it, there's also the what is it, the separate warp hypothesis that the language you speak determines how you think because of the yeah, of course, of the language. That so. makes sense. It's the same thing with how you have those A.I. tests where they come up being sexist and racist yeah. because languages are perverted to have certain ideological functions. It's all the same thing. So, again, this is a huge generalization of the, his theories. Which I are love that. Though, complex. Like, you could, it is really you beautiful. You could have this like, but here's the thing. You could have this like majestic like the head entering and like this low splash but no it just sort of flops in there disgustingly yeah but you still have beautiful water footage coming out this is some of my favorite like particle lighting in any movie ever you have the stuff with this water splash here which looks pretty phenomenal and then also like you have when he brushes aside the eraser dust later just the particle lighting in this movie is is really incredibly beautiful but at any rate that's what he would term passing into language right that is what makes you a conscious individual, but also in doing that, you sacrifice that unregulatedness that came before, right? Of course, the irony is that nothing came before because you weren't an actual conscious subject, but it's this weird thing. So at the, the thing is, he talks about it as this idea of giving something up. And that's why in like Lacanian psychoanalysis, this is what can motivate different types of drives for people, right? where once you sacrifice that thing that made you unregulated as you passed into language, you now have a drive to try to regain this thing that you feel like you are lacking. And I think that's a big part of this movie because as we're going to see here, this movie is all about making Henry a 
a desiring subject, as a, a psychoanalyst uh, analyzing this movie would say he is. Um, and we can see that in a lot of different ways. Uh, oh, yeah, there's the most obvious way later on. Um, with the Probably the most famous, <laughs> besides Henry himself, the most famous character in this is either the baby or the lady in the radiator. Yeah, um, yes. In, in many ways, she will become like a manifestation of that desire. Yes. But it's interesting because even here, you have this situation where... Ooh, you just stepped in that This is almost there. like Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I know we've jumped into the Lacan and yeah. over in, in intellectualizing this movie, and I think it certainly lends itself to that. But one thing I also wanted to try to do with this movie is encourage people to, to not necessarily, if they're watching it for the first time or just really struggle understanding it, reach out. Oh, my God. I'm going to quote George Lucas. Reach out with your feelings and try to work through it emotionally. Because I think that's where this movie really starts the intellectualization process. No, you should. This is another one of those movies. It's that, very like, relatable. God forbid you're listening to it with us for the first time. Yeah, like I mean, we make fun of David Lynch for his like stu- like his, snootiness, but his goofy voice and his more than slight I mean, pretentiousness. I, I, I do love his voice, but um. It is definitely a movie that is accessible on an emotional level, and I feel like a lot of people just neglect that because they they have this impression of it before they watch it, that it's like it's bizarre, and then they have to try to solve the riddle. And it's like, like any other movie, the riddle can be in there, and you can find some sort of ideological subtext in it or whatever, but you can do that for any movie. And this movie, I think, works really well on an emotional level, and you don't, I, I think that gets ignored. Um, the way I would encourage somebody to watch this movie if they hadn't seen it for the first time is try not to focus so much on figuring out, figuring out the grand scheme of it as much as you are just trying to figure out the emotional truth of every moment. Right. And that brings us back to what we're saying about lack. How can we figure out that he is a desiring lacking subject? Cause remember those things are equivalent. If you desire something in a certain way, it is like an acknowledgement that you lack it right? Uh, How do we know that he is this? Because he's walking around in this grim, dark world. Uh, He looks in his mailbox and there's nothing there. He reaches deep in there and there's nothing. Yes. He reaches deep. Thank you. Um, And just like this silence, he gets in the elevator and hits yes. the button. And it, we just made you listeners experience that lack as well. You're like, where the pod? I'm lacking the podcast now. <laughs> Am I lacking Wi-Fi? Is that why it's going? Oh on? my god, what happened? Yes, yes. And it's the same thing here with this elevator. See, we're making a stupid joke there, but that's correct. <laughs> if two if two podcast co-hosts in the middle of a podcast just stopped talking, you'd be like. What's going on? Especially if you're watching a movie and you're trying to follow along. If two people like, what are, is this? If two people are talking into a microphone and nobody's listening to their podcast, does it really <laughs> exist? Oh man, Max, don't ask that question. But it's the we're, what we're talking about here is on display perfectly in this entire opening sequence because this is all stuff that could be dealt with in another movie in about two seconds, right? You just show a shot of him walking into his. <laughs> into the door of the thing and you you've established but i was saying uh, yesterday that i really liked the elevator thing because it really just hammers home how fucking lonely he is because like the door opens instantly he gets in and then even it seems like even the door is reminding him that there should be more than one person getting in the elevator yeah Uh. and then it's like this idea that it's not just the loneliness of it it's like the loneliness and the emptiness This entire movie is empty. There are so many parts of the frame and all these different parts of this movie that are just black, right? And there's so many different ways that it it like tries to put his sort of psychological feeling of lack and alienation onto the screen, whether it's when he's walking and it takes 10 seconds for him to cross the frame. And it's like, this is slow. Or you just see him walking into the room and he can't find his mail or it takes 10 seconds for the elevator to close. It's like you constantly feel the lack because you want something to happen. Same thing here. He's going to run up against this woman for the first time, his neighbor across the hall. Yes. You know, the one who, as I do, when I tell my neighbors that somebody called for them, I seductively hold my shirt open and expose my chest and yes. just sit there. Uh, well, you realize that you're an object of desire for them. Yes, of course. Because I know my entire life is a David Lynch movie. Yeah. 
I have to act that way. Now, the other interesting thing about this is I think because people see this movie and it's so, it so much feels like a personal vision that they seem to undervalue the extent to which uh, it might have any sort of political implication or say anything about the system in which he lives. Um, however, I think it does, it does do that. It's not some like, it's not just pure weirdness, you know, it's not purely personal expression oh, no, or that's something. That's the thing. Like it's not as on the nose as seconds for sure. Another movie we've done. And I jokingly brought up Tetsuo, the Iron Man before, but although appropriately, yes, yeah. uh, it's not, as political as either of those, I would say. Not as overtly. Yes. At uh, any rate. But it definitely does have a little bit of it in there. I do think it ties the act of... of It it ties personal experience to the political realm, though, I think, where there are certain things that happen to him personally and internally have political implications uh, later on in the movie. Another interesting thing here is that I think this movie, uh, even you know, part of the reason why is hard for people to really deal with is that Lynch again deals with like an emotional poetic logic frequently. Like I think of images like that, that, um, that, uh, record player, right. Which it reminds me of things like, you know, it's not quite the same the way he uses it, but from like the third part of the wasteland with T.S. Eliot, he uses his idea of record player. Um, but it seems here to be some sort of interesting thing where again, he seems like he's an automated person in a sense where he puts on this, record player and it's spinning round and round and there's this music that is sort of like the diegetic non-diegetic music to his life so to speak and he's just sitting here and he seems kind of regulated and controlled and mechanized in a way which is part of what makes him a desiring subject is he's so mechanical and stilted and awkward um he clearly does not have any sort of like strong sense of life or vitality or enjoyment in his life yes and uh, I think the record player, the automated nature of that is something that, you know, it itself being a mechanical object and something that's created through like industry and factory stuff is interesting to me. Um, and we can hear it barely right now through the headphones, at least I can. And uh, the other, the other, I'm segueing into the discussion of the sound. The sound is a huge thing in this movie. Sound is very important. Um, cause one of the cool things again, that happens with that record player is that you hear the music slowly fade and then the static sort of picks up a little bit and then it starts to sound a little bit like cicadas as he starts looking at the radiator for the first time. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting the way he uses sound to indicate different types of discomfort and stuff like that. Also, again, I want to say that, that, that Jack Nance's window here is the perfect image of this movie. Right, he yes. is. You have you have the open window, the the thing that yes. should provide you with the an view, escape, yeah, or at least something to desire to look at, to look yes. at far away, and it's just immediately cut off by a brick wall. You have the desire, but there is no object for the desire. Yes, I think that's an important thing, at least for this first part of this movie. Jack Nance is just sort of walking around doing his thing, but it's kind of like he clearly is lacking just from what we've just talked about already. There's a photo of a nuclear bomb in the background. So yeah, that's something. Maybe he just, just wants everything to die. Maybe, maybe that was his birthday. <laughs> oh God. But yeah, so it's it weird to think that people were born on the day <laughs> that we dropped bombs. But that is weird to think of. Ugh. What a horrible country we live in. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday was ha- yeah, the 4th of July for us. Woo. You mean the day that, I'm actually wearing the military my military ran the airports. Yes, I'm actually wearing my. They manned the airports. Listen, I I don't care what <laughs> thing our glorious leader managed to come out of his pie hole recently. Like, who the fuck cares? If you didn't even hear about it, I'll let you figure it out. I know, I know what. Okay, it is, but yeah, let, uh, this movie makes me slightly less sad than whatever Trump says. So, at any rate, this movie, the beginning part of it, is filled with objectless desire where he yeah. he can't even really articulate anything about his own experience at this point um but he will through like fantasy sort of start to figure it out and put the pieces together later on um and i think that's an interesting part of that window image too is that 
you have the desire there, but there's nowhere for it to go because he just has no thing to grab onto, grab onto at any, like anywhere. Does he think he wants to get with his ex? I don't know. You know? Well, like that's the thing. Like she, if we're going purely real here, like she's the one who stopped seeing him by the way that they talk. He tore up the picture, but still kept it which means he had probably just kind of recently given up hope, I'm assuming, that yeah. he would come back. The other interesting th- part, part about that is when he opens the drawer, there's a little bowl of water with coins. And the way he drops a coin into it makes it seem to me very much like uh, dropping a coin into a fountain yes. and making a wish. Um, and it makes it seem like it's some sort of repeated behavior where every time he looks at her picture, he throws the coin in there, you know? Uh, and I think... That, again, also is something that can inform the subtext of the desire being something that's kind of distant, and he doesn't really have a way to focus his desire or find an object for it, but also the way in which it is part of this world and this system in which he's been inducted into. Like, this is the whole thing we didn't really finish saying about the whole prologue sequence, Yes, is if we take that Lacanian reading, it is not simply the origin of the baby, it is a sort of flashback for the origin of Jack Nance himself, right? As a desiring being. It's his genesis and entrance into this awful world where he cannot find any enjoyment and he is regulated and can't find a way to actually express his desire. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So I think it's interesting that you can look at it that way, where it is both the baby and him, especially because the baby will come to be an embodiment of of what is trapping him in his life, you know, uh, and his yeah. lack. But we're about to get the most uncomfortable just dinner scene in <laughs> film history, aside from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> So you know what I'm gonna say that's less uncomfortable because at least like all but one of them are having a good time. Yeah, you're, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it is reminiscent of that for a number of reasons, but I'm gonna say that they're having a better time overall than they are here. Because the interesting thing about this is that they're all well it, experiencing a certain type of lack. Clearly, when she gets out from Texas Chainsaw, spoilers for the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes, which if you haven't seen, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, but she does get out. So that means that nobody's having a good time by the end of that dinner. So it does even out eventually. I don't know. Uh, and the dad uh, is having a good time for part of this. Leatherface is like dancing at the end. Yeah. He's flipping out, but he's like, woo. And he's flipping the chainsaw. He's like one of those people at the circus flipping chainsaws in the air, juggling them. I, that seems like, you know, he cut himself. Okay. Food got away. Okay. But he's he's living it up. Is Gunnar Henson still alive? Uh, pro- I, like I don't he, think I so. I think he passed away a couple he years ago. He passed away recently, I think. <sighs> he seemed like a good guy, though. Just a good old time, but oh. Here we, she goes through some sort of like... Seizure? Seizure, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because I think the way that the mother has to comb her hair, again, if you're talking about an image of like something that's a certain type of regulation, straightening out her hair with combs, you know, so it's straight and not knotted, right? It's making, it's, it's this weirdly mechanical act to perform on your body in this movie, right? Um, and again, I, it's something that calms her like little seizure that she has, uh, which is elicited when, when she's talking to Henry about his job, right? Yeah, like she's worried that, her parents are going to be angrier already because this man isn't worthy, but I've always interpreted it as, so it's like her brain just short circuits in that moment before she can be just like, Oh, he's a printer. He works there. I guess the reason why I feel like you can fish for different motivations behind that is because since we've already established so thoroughly how alienated and it's not just that Henry is alienated from the world. The world itself is alienating. This is the essence of everything in this movie. So we've already established that with him. And now that we actually get other characters, we're like, okay, definitely everyone is this way (laughs) to a certain extent. Um, We'll see later on that it's not 100% the case, but for the most part, it's like this. And these people are also very much desiring, lacking subjects, right? And we know that from how stilted the conversation is, right? They behave the same way he behaves. 
And we know since she has her own sort of fit that she does and the way that they talk to him and the fact that since we've seen this before and we know that they're keeping a big secret for him, that they have a certain type of interiority that is sort of only being hinted at in this scene. So I still see them as their own like desiring, lacking subjects. I think everybody in this movie is very much tied to like the central consciousness of Henry as a character, but they still do have their own type of independence. Although that can't necessarily be said for the, for the grandma character. Yeah. <laughs> this on. is super reminiscent of Texas Chainsaw for sure. Yeah. Good on, good on that woman, that old lady. <laughs> what do you mean? Good on her. I just like, I want to imagine like a young David Lynch coming up to her and just being like, okay, so for this scene, we're just going to have you sitting in a chair and then a, another lady's going to come up and move your hands. So you toss a salad and, and they do it. And he walks up and he's like, you did great. And she's like, what? Yeah. And we're going to put a cigarette in your mouth and you're just going to puff on it. And that That's your role in this movie. Oh honey, I didn't hear you. Did you, we start? You don't even get to eat in the dinner scene. I mean, she does a very good job of sitting there very, Just very, there. very still. Yeah. She would be like the most desiring subject in the sense that she's like so lacking that she just, she's lacking everything. So she's just sitting there like a robot. True. And this is the shittiest looking dinner I have seen. They're man-made chickens though. Look at my knee. Look at my knee. Just like right, yeah, regular ones, except they're smaller than your fist. Now, Max, have you ever been on a dinner to a dinner that is anywhere near as awkward as this? I'm trying to think. Like, are, specifically with a romantic partner, like going to their family's place? Uh, you mean if they're going to tell you that you impregnated somebody? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not quite sure you've been in that situation. I'm trying to think. I dated a girl in high school whose mom was like a, a zealous tea partier. Uh, but her mom also like adored me. For whatever reason, so that well, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. Yeah, that these people have. I know. I don't. I'm normally good with parents, which is a weird thing, but based on how I look, <laughs> but <laughs> I I normally get along with parents just fine. So I don't think I've ever had a dinner that's anywhere close to this awkward. Can I ask you another weird question? Yeah, of course. If you literally had to deal with this family, if you were just here, how would you? If they were behaving this way, because you know what? I don't know if I'd, I would. I think I would just, you know, what? I think I'd do it exactly what Henry would do. I think I'd just go for the ride. And I'm like, this is going to be over someday. Well, yeah, you can't. Everybody would be like, no, I'd just get up and leave. No, you can't do that. You wouldn't. You, you wouldn't. You, you definitely like, wouldn't. I feel like if I get up and leave, I could die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to wonder, by the way, um, I don't know if anyone else has ever noticed the similarity, whether or not. I think it's funny how he moves the knife and suddenly the dad flinches. I think yeah. the dad is a stealth good performance in this. I think he's pretty funny. Not even stealth. It's he's hilarious. <laughs> he's adding just like his level of like comedy and just bizarreness is adding like a level like it makes it more uncomfortable than if it was just the mom's pure negativity and interrogation the entire time. Definitely. And I think that's why, you know, people say this movie is like horrifying or whatever. And I'm like, I think it's more just it makes people uncomfortable. More yeah. than it is horrifying. I think it makes you uncomfortable very effectively too because it's not trying to be horrifying. It's actually, it's trying to just show you something about like normal cliche situations and do it in an uncomfortable way but not without a touch of comedy ever. Uh, I think there's a lot of good comedy in this and I think the sensibility, like you mentioned, referencing Charlie Chaplin is kind of like, you know, silent movie sensibility in many ways. Yeah. I think it's helpful to think of this movie perhaps in reference to different silent film techniques because I think it it is uh, interesting in how it structures its visuals, um, not necessarily in reference to those movies, but uh, using that like style of filmmaking as like a backdrop maybe. But at any rate, I was going to say, I wonder if anybody would say that this is some sort of reference or connection to the Alfred Hitchcock, Hitchcock movie Frenzy where there's a very similar scene, not very similar, but it's, you know, rye British people eating dinner and they have these little micro chickens that are exactly the same. And there's even the same, like there's the same thing where there's like a gag where they're trying to cut it and something goes wrong. It's very weirdly similar. I have to rewatch that movie to see exactly how close it is. 
Oh, this is my favorite react interaction in the movie. <laughs> so what do you know, Henry? Oh, I don't know much of anything. Sit in silence. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Just the fucking smile. feel like he's just gonna grab a knife and stab you <laughs> it's terrifying listeners you can't see it but that's what max and i are doing to each other right now well austin always holds a knife to my throat it's just no not that i'm saying i'm smiling this way yeah that comes later <laughs> the other interesting interesting thing about like the seizures that the mother and daughter have is is maybe something that is kind of like a hereditary thing going on where I think, um, you know, speaking of hereditary part of the interesting part of what that movie's project I felt was, was talking about like talking about how trauma can be something that is passed down almost genetically well, mental, in the same way. Mental illness in general, but yeah, I mean, not yeah. like, but not even detached from genetics, but working yeah. along the same logic, right. That people can, can induce trauma across multiple generations depending on whether or not they inherited trauma um, and they can pass it on. Uh, and I think it's interesting to look at this scene maybe in the same light and those seizures in the same light where perhaps the mother and Mary have some sort of similarity in that sense with their own sense of desire. Of course, you would have to do a really deep dive into trying to figure out, you know, in which way is their desire being regulated or is it being thwarted in some way? Because I think clearly Mary does not want to go into this situation either, and she's also just as alienated as he is. Yeah. Only the thing is, I think, if you look at the development of this movie and these two characters, I think in him and Mary could be seen as maybe being similar, only that Mary is farther along along that arc. So she has a better idea of how to articulate the object of her desire. And what she knows is that it is not Jack Nance and it's not the baby. Well, apparently the mom's object of desire was very different. Well, again, it's a really interesting moment because it makes me like question again, what, what regulates their desire, the way she like comes on to him in that way. Or perhaps you could say that's, that's reading too that's much. That's the best line in the movie. I'm sorry. Oh, they're, they're not even sure if it's a baby. <laughs> they're not even sure if it's a baby. There are a lot of neat lines in this movie. I like that one. I like you don't mind about getting married, do you? Uh, they're very Lynchian lines, I think. Oh. And again, we mentioned that Jack Fisk was the production designer on this, but I think this entire sequence is really a fantastic a uh, testament to the work he did on this. He had already done a number of big movies up to this point, but, you know, being able to... This movie is very independent, right? And they didn't have a huge budget, but it looks very expensive to me. Even though the sensibility feels independent, I think it looks very high-class, expensive. And I think a lot of that has to do with Jack Fisk and what he was able to bring to the table. Obviously, stuff like this, you know, has its own work that goes into it, but I just think it's like that thing that's blowing the air out in front of the house... Yeah. Like the exterior of the house looks insane. That like that looks amazing. How do you do that? You know? How do you make that work for no money? Takes a really well, talented we don't know person. What, yeah, well we don't know what the budget was for this. So But no, we but. do know it was small. Yeah. And it's not like they had a you know, the largest crew in the world necessarily. Everybody was doing double du duty on different jobs. That's the type of movie this was. No, all poor dog. The other interesting thing about the dog image here is like just the contrast of it, where you have this very dead, sterile feeling scene where they're gathering for a meal, but then you also have technically the pups are gathering for a meal in this specific way. And there's a weird contrast there. You know, it's the same thing, it's just different. And here we have the baby. Yes. I'm going to say the best, one of the best prosthetics in film history it's without great, question. Because this, what you were talking about yesterday, this is a very simple effect where it's like almost a sock puppet 
in terms of puppeteering. Like, you, yeah, you it's can have, clearly somebody's hand. You can have, yeah, yeah, an arm coming in through the table and operating it that way. But like, but you forget so quickly because it's just moist and it moves. It's like, so disgusting and naturally and it's, well performed. Uh, I'm not sure who performed this puppet, but it is fantastic the way they work the tongue to when it's feeding you know i think the fact that they just cut on it feeding right away do a good job of selling it because it's that great performance moment and it's such a lively act with it's like spitting out its tongue and it looks so much like a thing babies do that it's like oh christ it stops you like because you might I, i guess you're supposed to feel sympathy for the baby at the very end but like it's just so disgusting and constantly causing it problems. is really disgusting where like you understand like oh, look at the way why mary the just wants to leave and yeah. why he ends up fucking murdering it by the end it's really one it's just truly amazing and it's probably a good opportunity to talk about you know how they actually made it and what it's made out of so which we no one knows how it was made yes <laughs> Uh, that's pretty cool. I think if I had to guess, I would assume it is some kind of paper mache frame covered in some sort of like gummy substance. And then you look over that over it to give it the shiny eh, wet look. I don't know. I've seen people, there's been things where like people try to recreate it, but they can't get it to like, they just can't. <laughs> Well, there is conspiracy theories that it is an actual aborted baby. No, like it's not. I know. It's just I appreciate that they keep it secret that nobody knows how they actually did it because it somehow adds to the magic of its effectiveness to me. Where it's like, oh my god, no one even knows how they did it. I kind of like that, you know. And I do appreciate again, regardless of how much, you know, we're (laughs) we're violating that the how useful it is right now by doing a commentary track. I do appreciate that David Lynch doesn't you know, feel the need to talk about his movies in that way. I appreciate that he leaves it as like an exploration for people. I get that. There's a diff. I think there's a difference though, between being like willing to open to just talk about your movies in general, rather than just be like, Oh, well my work speaks for itself and I'm not going to talk about it more. There's, there's a level of, yeah, I think he could do at certain points in his life. He could have done a little bit less like nuts. No, that's not the one, you know, like that's yeah. not what it, what it is, but you know, it is what it is. I think there's a certain usefulness to maintaining the mystique around a movie like this because it is really interesting and bizarre. At any rate, we just watched uh, Henry go to his mailbox again, and this is going to begin a cycle in this movie where a lot of the behaviors and things that he did before he acquired the baby and married Mary uh, are going to repeat. So the first one was the mailbox and what changed? He finds a tiny little box. He got a worm. He got a worm thing. It's not quite the same as the little worm at the beginning. Uh, what, what again, McGowan in that book would call the lamella, which is part of like, it's thinking about that idea of passing into language, but with like sex more specifically. Yeah. So it's something that has to do with like a sex drive, looking for the sexual loss you experienced when you became a sex, sexed being with the loss of the lamella. <laughs> Sorry, for some reason. <laughs> It's the way your voice sounded. It sounded like you were going to say sex pervert for a second. <laughs> you know, when you became a sex pervert, like everybody does. <laughs> when you became a sex pervert. <laughs> oh, God. Well, anyway. When you became a sex pervert, like David Lynch, you... I think David Lynch is a sex pervert. I'm not even going to speculate. I, I'm speculating that he definitely is a sex pervert. But I don't know. Good for him. He's earned the right at this point. I don't know. I'm not going to make assumptions about... Or maybe he's just like one of those people who like gets all of their weirdness out and their creativity and just enjoys really boring vanilla sex. This is the thing, too, where everybody speculates about Hitchcock, what weird things he did, but he would always talk about how he's kind of like just celibate. And I kind of believe that. Yeah. (laughs) You know? So again here, we have... We already have... he, He gets that little worm, right? Which we can say is like a reminder of the thing he lost. And then we get a hint of the fantasy for the first time. He already looked at the radiator once. We didn't get anything, but this time we get a hint. We see this, the setting of the stage, literally. Yes. And notably, when Mary asks him, did we get any mail? He's going to lie. He's going to say no. Why does he do that? Well, this is where we can connect this movie to a lot of other David Lynch movies that we might think of him uh, as being more, what we might think of more now when we think of David Lynch, stuff like Mulholland Drive, where... 
the the idea of the fantasy is already kind of happening in the sense that we know at least at some point in Jack Nance's care in Henry's past, you know, he might have seen Mary as like a type of object of desire, right? He even smiles when he goes on the bed. So in a certain sense, he possesses objects now only instead of being objects that fulfill his desire and, and negate his lack, they are things that exasperate it, right? So he's realizing now through, through having a wife and a kid that he still has not gotten rid of his lack and desire. He's so something's not lonely. right. Yes, it's still dark and miserable here, and I don't understand why I have everything I should. And I think you can see that epitomized in the performance when he first walks in and he has like the stereotypical like, Oh, look at my baby and my wife smile. And yeah. Just like slowly fades away when they, he realizes neither of them are reacting to it. And yeah. How disgusting the baby is. But then he still finds this hint, right? Yeah. And this is, this is, we can connect this to a Hitchcockian thing too, right? The idea of the stain. It's the little clue that shows you that things are wrong and that this perfect world is not really that perfect. Uh, and I think, that's something that comes up again in stuff like Mulholland Drive or Lost Highway very explicitly where characters will find clues that are like, wait a second, what's going on? Like, you remember in Mulholland Drive, right, where you can argue that a lot of that Manny uh, movie is a fantasy from the Diane character, right? The yes. Naomi Watts character. But even throughout the best parts of that fantasy for her, she will see little hints that tell her about the reality of the real world. It's still anchored in reality. And since reality is terrible and not the fantasy, there's the underlying threat of this being, it, it tells you that this is just not real. You know what I mean? And I think a similar thing is happening here, even though it's not really an explicit fantasy sequence like the later sequences we see with the radiator lady. He has these things in his life now, but he gets the little clues that you're still, you're still not out of this world of desire. You know, you have not achieved, you're not in heaven yet, yes. you know? Well, because he in heaven, everything is fine, yeah. obviously. And you've got your good things, and I've got mine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God, her hair just looks like the fucking, like, sticks and filth that we've been seeing up here everywhere yeah. in the film. What a great shot. Look how dark the shot is, but how much it expresses about the tone of this, right? They're finally sleeping. It's like their first night together or whatever, and the baby's just crying, and you just get that reminder of the bricks, Right. Again, yeah. the bricks are still there. They won't be there later in the movie, but right now they're still there. And we're still in the world of desire. And this is probably a good time to just talk about the cinematography specifically, where I think this movie obviously is very beautiful and it looks very expensive. But in a weird way, this is in a specific sense, this is very bad cinematography because it is not really directing its light in a way that at all elaborates on the scene. It's almost like every light is a spotlight or it's treated as a spotlight. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's there to isolate everything, but it's perfect for the aesthetic of this movie. So it turns out being really good cinematography because it just elaborates more on that sense of lack and isolation between different things, even in the same space in order for her to get to the baby. There's like six feet of just like pure black. She has to walk through. Right. And then there's a light on her bed, a little light on the window and then a spotlight on the baby. But it's not like you see anything about their apartment. You know, where's the wall? Oh, now you see it. Yeah. Now that she's turned on the lamp. And that's the other interesting thing about the lighting in this movie is that most of it is not source lighting, which is interesting. Even that lamp light is not source lighting. If you look at the uh, like coat hanger thing on the wall, you will see that the light is actually coming from above. Yeah. So it's interesting that they're able to achieve this very surreal dreamlike quality to the way everything looks and the way it's lit because they're able to eliminate they're able to eliminate like source lighting almost entirely from a lot of these sets. Or at least when they have source lights, 
or practical lights in the actual set. They're not actually using them to light the scene. It's always something that's coming from overhead or whatever. And of course, here's where their marriage is going to fall apart. After one whole day. We actually don't know how long it's been, but it definitely just does feel like this is the first night or something. Yeah. Of course, time moves a little bit strangely in this movie. And this is hilarious. Again, this is just another great moment of the comedy, also reinforcing that idea of lack, right? She keeps pulling and pulling and pulling, but she still can't get the object out from under the bed. You know what I mean? It's all about how do people interact with the object of what they want in this moment. And it's always delayed or they can't find it or it's just not there. It takes her like a thousand tries to get the thing out from under the bed. It's great. Originally, I thought she was going to bring out an axe and then kill him (laughs) the first time I watched this movie. Because I was just like, what is she doing? All alone. Boom, boom, boom. It's an old gorilla song. What? Nothing. Sorry. Dumb reference. But anyway, yes, we're... He's left wanting even more now. He doesn't even have the illusion of somebody with him. He just has a malformed baby constantly crying. And then this is a very interesting interlude because she's going to walk in now and we're going to see her a little bit again later, but it's interesting that she walks in now. Um, And I'm not the first time I really watched this movie. I didn't think that his interactions with his neighbor were a fantasy, but I think they might be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the way that he's going to, cause he's going to see the radiator for the first time, the radiator later for the first time before he actually has that like love making scene with his neighbor. And I think the aesthetic is similar. I don't know if you're going to say like, because he was in bed at the start of both these scenes that he's like, for sure it's like a dream, but it's definitely some sort of fantasy, whether it's a dream or whatever it is. And I think, this is a good time to reference again why this connects to Wizard of Oz. Why does it make sense that David Lynch likes Wizard of Oz? Well, let's think about it. She begins her movie in the real world and she's lacking. She has problems. Beginning of your character arc, right? There's something yes. wrong and my character's got to fix Everything's it. Everything's boring. All these men around here are dumb and stupid and I hate them. And I, I don't I like my family. Yeah. And then desire is the thing that sets the plot in motion. Right? You have this tornado or whatever. She gets up, sucked up to the land of fantasy, the land of Oz. And then you see the same actors from the real world appear in Oz. But this time they're a little bit different, right? So they're reminders of the real world still, but in the fantasy space, she can resolve her problems, right? And then she comes back to reality and she is now stronger. Everything has been reconciled. And that makes a lot of sense when you look at David Lynch's movies, because I think they work in similar ways. And I think this movie specifically works in similar ways. In some of his later movies, characters don't seem to be as successful in using fantasy to actually uh, succeed in any sort of way. Although this movie, even though it's ambiguous at the end, I think uh, he still definitely achieves a level of like agency that he doesn't have for most of the movie. Uh. Oh, God, that's disgusting. Yeah, no shit, he's sick. He's been sick this whole time, Jack. What kind of doctor lets you take home your baby like that? Jesus Christ. (laughs) David Lynch doctor. Yes, David Lynch is the actual doctor in this movie. Oh, God, it's just disgusting. Would you trust David Lynch as a doctor? I wouldn't trust David Lynch near me in general. I mean, he's fine. Yeah, if he's making quinoa, maybe. (laughs) I'm going to post that in the show notes. That can get real. (laughs) <laughs> so now this baby is what getting super fucking high man yeah that cool ass oh rig. god <laughs> that's why his eyes are rolling to the back of his head right stoned as shit yeah it's a very elaborate vapor rig uh either that or you know it's just like Healing oils. I love how he's just sitting there waiting for the baby to get better. (laughs) (laughs) What else is he supposed to do? Is that what he was doing like for six years while he was waiting for this movie to get made? Jack Nance. By the way, shout out to Jack Nance and his wife for being able to maintain that hair for 
six years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this movie takes six, took six years to make, so if his hair looks slightly different in some scenes, that's because of that. Yeah. I believe it was the assistant director who said that that was the hardest part of filming over six years was maintaining his hair. Yeah. And that makes sense because that is one hell of a hairdo. Yeah. Weirdly, it reminds me of Pedro Almodovar's hair, which is something. Oh, wait. Did that little squeaky thing disappear? Oh, now he's thinking about the mailbox again. And then his last name is Spencer. Is there any interpretation we have for that? I just think it's it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't matter to me that his last name is Spencer. I don't think it means anything. Uh, Spencer's gifts. He likes, you, you know what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely. He, li- he likes dildos and uh, <laughs> fart. Uh, what? Fart joke t-shirts. Spencer's gifts. That's like all they sell there. It's like dildos? Yeah, they have tons of dildos at Spencer's gifts. I've never been to one. Yeah. I assumed it was like a family gift store. No, Spencer's Gifts now. God, no. It's like those shirts that are just like, you're hot after eight beers and it's... Female it, body inspector. Yeah, shit like that. Yeah. Dildos and pot shirts. Like, it's... If you think about it, a dildo is a real female body inspector. It's like... For... It's the store for people who enjoyed Suicide Squad is the best way I can put it. Like, Okay. Yeah. So we put them all in one spot so we yes. can identify them and stay away. <laughs> exactly. People always blame a Hot Topic for that. It's Spencer's Gifts, people. Oh, Those Max. Real victims. You and your Hot Topic apology tour. I No, I worked at a Hot Topic. I fucking hated it. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. You <laughs> hate them. I'll take that back. What were we talking about before we got sidetracked by <laughs> the knows? Spencer's Gifts nonsense? Uh, his last name is Spencer. Yeah. Does that mean anything? Well, he does not work at Spencer's Gifts. He works at a printmaking factory. Yes, he could print the designs for the t-shirts at Spencer's Gifts, though. We don't. Or know. our show! No, he can't do that. No, because we don't have shirts. No. But darn it. Well, that's not the first reason why. <laughs> but uh, Only G-strings. But... <laughs> Yes, as we've discussed, we only produce G-strings. If you want one, you can get in touch with us. Uh, they have our logo. We will literally make them just for you. If you yeah. actually reach out and say you want one. We make that like, it, it's like also like imagine like a thong with our logo right in front. It's perfect. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> Don't say anyway. Uh, this is a perfect discussion to be talking about in the middle of a racer head yeah so i think uh bringing up that he he works as a printmaker is interesting although i'm gonna have to do it quickly before we get the radiator lady for the first time but uh it's something that's going to become more relevant later during the actual eraser head scene because then he's going to become part of this mode of production which this movie will imply is partly responsible for ensnaring him in this world of desire and creating the world of desire in the first place. Um, although we'll get back to that after this radi- radiator lady scene. And can I ask you, what did you think the first time you saw this? Um, I thought she represented just... It was very simplistic the first time. I thought she just represented death, sort of, as just like any unknown is better than this miserable existence type thing. It is definitely, I can understand why you might think that because already the way this is shot and lit is very different. The first thing we get is that again, source lighting, which we don't get in the rest of the movie. That, but, but, Oh, can I finish my thought? Yeah, yeah, go, go. But, uh, we're going to see she, the weird sperm creatures from the beginning of the movie are going to start dropping from the ceiling. And those detonate life and are what started the movie. Right. And then she starts fucking stomping on them. So I interpreted that the first time I saw that as her being the antithesis to life and just being what he ultimately desired and her being also another weird blonde lady. Like she was a slightly like stranger version of Mary to me. 
But I, I've completely changed my opinion since the first time I saw it, but that's what I remember. I'm not sure what I made of it the first time because it's a little bit easier to get through once you get to her saying about heaven and then yeah. it makes a little bit sense about some sort of like death or something. And you're like, I guess he would kill himself before doing this. But I think with this, definitely the way I see it now is like, okay, you established that it's a completely different world because of the way that's lit. It's quite different. Also, we begin with a very dynamic camera move, which we haven't had mu- much of, right? We get this tracking shot across the floor, and then it pans up to her, and then we move back to get the wide shot. It's a very dynamic move to introduce this sequence. And also, I think the way in which this entire sequence presents itself as something that is like a performance, she's looking right into the camera. And God, her catch lights in her eyes look so yeah. fucking creepy. Um, but it's definitely something that's very different and it's going to become more elaborate as the movie goes on. But this I think is the first real fantasy sequence of this movie where he can actually see his desire as something that is embodied and represented, even if he can't quite touch it yet. You know what I mean? Now for the first time, now that he has these clamps on his desire, he has a better idea of how to articulate it as an object, and through fantasy, he does that. And it comes out as the radiator lady. The reason why she's stepping on those things, I think, which are maybe symbolic of his lack and what he's looking to recover, is how it reinforces that she's still sort of eluding him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And this, this is... This is a very accurate portrayal of trying to sleep in the same bed as somebody <laughs> definitely with a baby in the same room it sounds awful this is definitely where the movie gets really funny too where he's just like move over and it's clearly like something's wrong with her yeah. um although i'm not quite sure if this is a fantasy sequence either and the reason why i'm not sure is because he's again going to pull out those what we might call lamella ish objects from her and he's going to start flinging them against the wall right And the reason why that's interesting is because it's further proof to him. This is now two moments in a row where things we've seen him desire, women, um, are going to take these objects and then they're going to like step on them in the first time or they're going to come out of her. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's almost like this is some sort of realization on his part that she does she does not actually possess the thing that motivates his desire. You know what I mean? The thing that he lacks. She does not actually possess it. It's like this weird realization. You know what I mean? And she's like caught in this weird bundle and it's very disturbing. Or she's full of the thing that caused him pain in the first place, which is arguably his fault, but still. Well, I think the reason why I think it's more that she possesses them, but they're not really like there is because he's going to move on to the radiator lady being more of a primary thing of desire. Whereas perhaps in the past you could have seen this, but now he's sort of realizing that it's just like not really true. He's not like intellectualizing it in that way. It's just that this thing that he lacks is now suddenly oozing out of his wife. And now it's making it so that it's some weird, horrifying realization that his life is actually not, he doesn't possess what he thought he possessed. You know, what he was afraid he didn't possess, his fears were correct. And um, I think part of that is informed by just how disturbing that is. I think that is the first scene that is really disturbing in this movie because of the way she's kind of like asphyxiated, you know, and she's like strangling herself in the blankets. It's really creepy. Of course, this tr- this transition, I, I'm not really sure what to make this, to be honest. David Lynch had a passion for stop animation. He developed somewhere in the six years <laughs> this movie was being made. He and does do a lot of stop motion stuff in his shorts. Yeah. I just don't understand why it's going like, wee <laughs> For like every five seconds, like, <laughs> it's like it's making some sort of high-pitched noise. It's squealing, and I'm like, okay, I don't understand. Is this little worm thing? And it's well, going to open its mouth like a sandworm, and we're going to go inside. <laughs> something that he would return to later with his masterpiece Dune. But I want to see David Lynch make a movie that's just like every moment is a transition from one, like going through one circle or edifice to the next. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? It's like the opening of uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, <laughs> except for two hours, and just see how weird he can make every like portal you go through. It would turn into the human centipede pretty quickly. <laughs> except you're going through the human centipede. Yes. Yeah, that'd be interesting. But again, I'm going to say that this is a moment of fantasy. One of the thing that, things that happens during these moments of fantasy is that we go through these little portals, right? David Lynch loves doing this throughout all his movies where there's some sort of object that becomes a thing you go through to reach a type of fantasy element, you know? Whether it's like a box or an ear or whatever the fuck it is, you know? Oh, God. It's just lonely and sad of I'm going to stare at my disgusting plant. I was telling Austin the other day that one of my roommates and I were discussing getting a house plant because we thought it would liven up the place and also be a good thing to keep us all responsible for things. But then we realized it would probably just end up looking like <laughs> that thing. Yeah, so why even try? Yeah, probably will at some point. You mean when there's no more plants outside? Yes. We have oxygen. We need oxygen, guys. It's time to take responsibility. So I'm going to water it on Wednesdays and Thursdays. <laughs> That's it. But don't ask me to do it. Don't expect me to do it any other day. All right, guys? Ooh, something about this is really creepy. Not just the way it's shot, but like just the fact that that uh, you have that close-up and it's just complete black. You don't necessarily expect it to be a big close-up of her face. This actor has a really evocative face, the woman that, the, his neighbor. Yeah, well, she's playing it great. Yeah. But... Yeah, no, I I do remember thinking that this was probably a fantasy at this point. And uh, the interesting thing about this scene, I think, is that it's going to be, again, the third scene in a row where he encounters a woman and one that is in some way like a reflection of his desire, right? It seems like the radiator lady is like the most unadulterated version of his his desire being embodied for him. But then you have these real world, uh, these real world representations of his desire that he he wants to possess or has expressed some sort of desire of possessing in the past, but was blocked because of some sort of thing that's regulating his desire. And uh, he realizes first about his wife that she does not possess the sort of object cause of his desire truly. And I think he's going to learn the same thing about this woman, his neighbor. He valued the mystery more than he valued the woman herself. Shut up, baby. I'm trying to get laid. In certain s- <laughs> I mean, what would you do, Max? Got smothered that baby. I would have fucking left it at the hospital. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm not taking care of that weird fucking demon creature. I've seen Re- I've seen Rosemary's baby. I'm not giving birth to the Antichrist and taking care of it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Everybody who has an argument with these anti-choice people should cite Rosemary's baby. <laughs> be like, it could be the Antichrist, Aunt Trisha. You don't know. I've seen the omen. I can't take home a baby from the hospital because Satanists might have switched my original <gasps> baby with the- Generation Z. That'd be a great. A great trolling thing to do. Name all your children, Damien. Yeah, it's been long enough since the last one where you can get away with it now. Yeah, do it. He'll freak all of them out, and they'll be like, okay, maybe we're okay with this now. Of course, remember, in Rosemary's Baby, they name him Andy, so... (laughs) (laughs) Very... Slow. Everything seduction. in this movie is very slow. It's deliberate, though. Yes, I know. Yeah. That's part of the challenge of talking about this movie, is that a lot of the action is drawn out to emphasize that feeling of lack, and then when you're talking about it, you can finish talking about it in, like, a few minutes. Although you can obviously elaborate a lot on how beautiful a lot of this works uh, looks. I mean, even in the way they made those catch lights, it looks like they... They didn't even light him directly. It's like they had a light outside a window, then got his reaction shot to the window, which is interesting. Now, Max, during the prep screening, you brought up a really interesting connection about this moment. Oh, yeah. So if we're going to see here, it's going to pull up, and there are 
having sex in <laughs> in a pool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I've always made the connection of because in the beginning of the movie you have the planet and you have the sperm creature thing just flopping into this primordial pool. Yes. Which is the kickoff, and I think that's very clearly echoed here with them having sex right next to the baby. But yeah. They're sinking into that same primordial pool that was the cause of the pain in the beginning. Yeah. Which again is like, I had never really made that connection, but it is kind of similar. And it even begins with the same sort of shot where the shot approaching the planet at the beginning is, is like this looming slowly, like pushing in on the planet as it gets larger. Yeah. And then this, it's like, it's sort of pushing in on them, but it's looming up from the bottom of the bed and it kind of resembles the planet in that way. So I think, you could definitely make that connection. I think the movie sort of indicates that formally. But once again, it's... We well, just get this mess of... And the hair, yet again, looks like the weird fucking clump of shit that's been following him around the entire movie. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what to make of the weird, like, gra- grass clippings. Is that what it is? Almost, yeah. It's something. Or reverse. And then... Uh, we're finally going to get our song, our favorite song here, Max. Yes. Not quite yet, but soon. Soon enough. No, it's going to be happening right now. It's like she sees something and it's going to be a reaction shot to this. Or no, the planet. This is the other interesting thing that we didn't mention, um, specifically during this sequence, when we first see that little like worm dude running around screaming, is that we see more and more of the planet. Yes. Right? Which is, again, where that dude pulling the lever... He pulled pulled the strings! Here we go. Pull the strings, Max. He's pulling the strings, and we see more and more of him the more and more he's in fantasy. And it's interesting because one of the arguments that McGowan makes in this book is that he uses fantasy to work through his problems, which, again, I think makes sense because it connects to that idea of, yes. like, the whole thing with Wizard of Oz and whatnot. That makes sense to me. And the more and more he delves into the fantasy, the more he realizes not only how much he lacks the objects of his desire, um, but he also realizes how like this capitalist production world that like led him into this process is responsible for putting him in this situation and yeah. to a certain extent. Um, and part of the just mechanics of how that works is that the reason why he becomes more aware of it as he goes along is because in fantasy it creates the illusion of an object that doesn't exist. You know what I mean? It doesn't exist in the real world, but in fantasy it exists. So in seeing it in fantasy, he realizes how much it doesn't exist in the real world. You know what I mean? It's all about the contrast. And certainly the song is sort of a, a testament to, to that it's mindset. Just surreal and like slightly off key at points and just it's done perfectly. She's so earnest in everything. And also she looks like almost slightly terrified. It's yeah. great. Well, this is this is gonna be an interesting moment because this is when he's first going to a- interact with the radiator lady. This is when the fantasy is going to seem like it's potentially coming real, but then we're going to get a violent reaction after this, which is going to spring us into the eraser head sequence. Uh, but the interesting part of this is, again, she's on a stage, right? Yes. And this is why the ending of this mu- movie will be ambiguous once it's all said and done, when he embraces the radiator lady. Because the stage makes it suspicious in the same way that, like, in seconds, Rock Hudson's entire life is a stage. Yes. So... If we're looking at these fantasy sequences as something that under like reveals some sort of underlying structure that creates this world of desire and feeds off it for its own like continuation for the continuation of the structure, then even the objects of your desire become very suspect, right? Even this is not something that comes without ambiguity. And we're going to see that because the moment he touches her, we get this bright flash of light and then she's just going to fucking disappear. But who is going to show up again is none other but lever dude, Jack Fisk. Tetsuo the Iron Man. Yes. See, I would say that you could probably look at this movie and read him as an embodiment of the Lacanian big other, which is another term he uses, which is basically the embodiment 
again, this is much more sophisticated. Yeah, go if for you it. Research it. But the big other I is kind of like it. this embodiment of the rules that are impressed upon your mind by language, right? So language isn't owned or mastered by anybody, right? But it, it sort of, if it shapes all the way we think, then it masters us in this weird way. But then how do you assign like a responsibility for that? The big other is like this fictional invention of this character, so to speak, that is kind of like the one who governs the way we think, but it's not actually anything real. It's this weird non-existent ent- entity, you know, that is like supposed to exist in our mind. Does this make sense? No, it makes perfect sense. I thought yeah. I wasn't sure if you were done explaining it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could go much farther than that, but um, you could maybe look at him that way because he's somebody who is pulling the strings on everything and he's hidden away. He's hidden behind the world. And also it relates to Henry being a printmaker, right? Very he's true. somebody who reproduces, you know, signs and signifiers, right? <laughs> Sorry. Just that balcony, I think, of Stander and Waldorf from the Muppets. And just... <laughs> Can you imagine them watching this? That guy's really oh, losing oh, his oh. head. Oh, 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 oh. I wonder if they've ever made jokes about Eraserhead. That I seems just... like a very Jim Henson thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't hear it, but the uh, the baby screaming in this yeah. is just the best. I love it. Yeah, it's definitely great. Of course, the imagery of this is not in terribly subtle at this point, if you're following along with the way we're looking at this movie where his head explodes off and it's replaced by the baby. It's certainly some type of like castration idea, right? Um, where he finally is close to possessing the thing he lacks, but the closer he gets to it without actually possessing it, the more he feels his lack. So when he is unable to possess it and he sees Jack Fisk instead, yeah, his head just explodes. <laughs> um, and it's replaced by the baby. That's when the baby truly become, becomes like the, the image of his lack. But I guess my whole point in bringing up the Jack Fisk thing is, you know, relating it to the idea of it being a stage is like, okay, so if this entire, if you're, if the object of your desire is something, if you're being manipulated, right, by this big other or just somebody pulling the strings, whether it's the capitalist system, whatever you want to say, uh, then this entire thing is suspicious, which is why a stage is suspicious because every fantasy is it's kind artificial, of artificial. Yeah. Every fantasy in this sense is kind of voyeuristic, right? Just like the window, right? Desire is also associated with like looking at something. Yeah. And well, possessing it's it. It's constructed. Yes. And part of the voyeur- voyeurism aspect of it is that you're not necessarily like, it's not constructed for you. That's what the voyeur wants. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the scene is hilarious. Just the, kid awkwardly holding the head. Yeah, this sequence is pretty funny. But yeah, the voyeur doesn't want like artifice constructing the scene. You know? <laughs> That's one of like the few lines of dialogue we can actually hear with the volume. Going <laughs> almost very all. loud. <laughs> you know, uh, that guy at all the parties in Hollywood, every time somebody Paul came in, he had to say the line again. Really? He's like, do I got to do this again, guys? <laughs> Is that true? Or are you just making Oh, no, I'm now? just assuming. Yeah. That's what always happens. That's what happens to everybody. Samuel Jackson. How many times do you think he said, hold on to your butts? Well, that's like a... Or tasty beverage. Rest in peace, Gary Coleman. But I remember Gary Coleman got like really fucking annoyed where every time he was walking in public, somebody would come up to him and be like, what you talk about, Willis? He's like, I didn't say anything to you. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye now. You just leave me alone. I didn't play Willis, so sorry about that. But yeah, and any, my point with all that is just the voyeur looks for a scene that is not constructed. Of course, the irony is that the scene is always constructed for the voyeur. And the more that they realize it's constructed, the more their fantasy falls apart, right? Which is why I think, you know, his head kind of explodes. And this is definitely like seems like the most random and out there part of this movie. Do we know what this kid is doing now? Is he just like a tax attorney or something? Cause I know he was like, <laughs> like he was like just somebody's 13 year old nephew that they got to be in the movie. Yeah. I like, know. I don't know what he's doing. I wonder, cause I always think about that. Cause like there's the, you know, no, yeah. Nirvana, the 
famous uh, baby in the swimming pool. I remember NPR tracked him down. Oh, just leave them alone. No, he's like super like into that scene, like punk rocker <laughs> or like a grunge style, hardcore garage band. Now I'm just like, was that just like, did his parents let him be on the cover of the Nirvana album because they were already into that? And so he was raised in that or it was like it destiny. It's like you were on the cover of the album. I know much like Macbeth. It's yes. a question of destiny or did you psych yourself out into doing this? Of course, now we see his head has been made into erasers. I also have to say, visually, I love this machine. Oh, it's great. It's just neat looking. We agreed on something yesterday that initially we thought this movie was called Eraser Head because of his hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that's a common yeah. occurrence. People just see that famous image of his face and it's like, his hair? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, it's because his head gets turned into an eraser. And we are saying maybe in terms of like looking at how, like again, capitalism decapitates people in a certain sense, you know, you could connect this maybe to Toby damn it in a specific way. Um, at any rate, it's interesting that his head becomes a thing that, you know, erases signs and signifiers because he was a printer. Yes. It's an interesting contrast. Uh, and it's something that again, reducing like reproducing those signs and signifiers as a printmaker is something that uh, would obviously connect to the idea that he's regulated by language in this Lacanian sense. That's so beautiful. It is. Oh, and it looks like the fantasy might be over for now. Back to disgusting reality. Everyone. Of course, now that we're back to reality, we have all these new insights because he has seen this whole process and his role in this process. You know what I mean? He uh, has he has seen that he cannot possess this fantasy, and he's been, I guess you could say, cock-blocked, as the yeah. kids might say, uh, by Jack Fisk with his levers. And uh, then he sees that his head gets decapitated and turned into erasers. Well, even back in real life, the if the relationship with the lady next door did actually happen, like she left without saying anything, to him. Yes, you could still, even if it did happen, you could say that the baby alienated her. Yes. Yeah, so it still put everything beyond his grasp. Of course, here's the real interesting thing now. Where are we looking right now? We're looking out his window. No more bricks. And we you know what he's looking at now, though. Is, well, it could be. It could just be an alley. Nah, he's looking out his window now. I'm no. saying that we now have a view outside this window. Only now it reveals. Yeah, no, I think it's just Max. I'm telling you. You tell can me. you can tell me. I disagree. Well, at any rate, we had bricks before. Now we get to see a view, and it's uh, terrible of somebody getting their shit. And you know what it is, Max? I'm really. That's the violence inherent in the system. <laughs> it's the violence inherent in the system. Help! Help! I'm being oppressed. You, did you get that, Reverend? Did you get it? On the Holy Grail, one of the most well-watched comedy films of all time. No, that's that's from a different movie. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's interesting because we get that revelation now, right? That's another one of those repeated moments where we get all these shots of the window, and then finally we get the shot where there's now no longer bricks, but it is violence. So he has the desire still, only now because he has gone through fantasy and it has better articulated you know, the objects of his desire and how he fails to possess them. Uh, he now can direct his desire in a more yeah. specific way, which is why this is the part of the movie where he finally has agency. He's going to go across the hall and he's actually going to knock on the door. Doesn't do anything, but he did it for the rest of the movie. He's entirely passive, but now he's proactive. And he's disappointed and sad, but at least he did something. Ooh, we, what a high standard for our character. At least he did something. I mean, based on what he did so far. And this is really interesting. And kudos again to the people performing the baby, where the baby has to go from being like very realistic and selling it on actually being kind of a real baby in its mannerisms. But then it has to go to like a cackling villain because <laughs> yeah. it's laughing at him here. It's cool that they're able to sell that transition. Well, I think as an audience member, you kind of already hate the baby to a degree. If you're like, you actually care about the character, you're just like, everything is just going terrible for him because this fucking baby, yeah. which makes you forget that like it wasn't even his life was shit before the baby as well. So in a certain sense, there is no before the baby. 
you know, as far as we know. Since yeah. a lot of people do look at that opening scene as like some metaphorical, like... Well, yeah, but he wasn't aware of the baby for at least part of the movie. I mean, yeah, He was still miserable. The baby is like just the progression of his, like, him having to confront the fact that there's barriers to what he wants and his own enjoyment and satisfaction in life. The other interesting thing about the window that I uh, didn't really mention is how, again, it informs the amb- ambiguity of the ending. Because I think even though now he has the power to like direct his desire, I'm still very suspicious of the woman in the radiator as like this true image as, of something that's beyond the system he's made. Because I, I think you can't necessarily say that like, something that is conceived of within the system is actually beyond the system, even if it's in fantasy, you know? And it's not like she looks different at the end. It's just, no. they're surrounded by bright white light. So it doesn't necessarily for me imply that it's any less of a constructed image for him. <laughs> from what I've understood, there was, cause there was a midnight showing of this movie when I went to school at uh, Keene state, the okay. local movie theater. Pretty cool. And from what I understand, uh, at this part in the movie, the theater just slowly started ch- uh, chanting, kill the baby <laughs> over and over. I'm sure some of them knew. Yeah. So the person who started it knew. Like, yeah. Well, no, everybody there had seen going. the movie already. Like it was just oh, like, that's, that's kind of cool. But also like, yeah, it'd be cool to go to see this in a, in a theater for the first time. Cause I feel like if you watch a movie like this in the theater for the first time, you're going to catch a lot of the comedy notes that you might not if you're just watching it by yourself. Yeah. If you're watching it by yourself, you might just be really focusing on like what is going on and you might work a little bit too hard in trying to figure it out instead of like just trying to enjoy it. Uh oh, oh my god. She'll sleep with anybody, even disgusting, sleazy that guy. I don't think it's so much saying that, so much as like or she's already moved on, or it was a fantasy. It, but it was doesn't a matter. Fantasy she's not his is Yes, is the real thing. Yeah. But her her reaction shot is the interesting thing, right? What does that mean? Oh my god. It's the same thing as before, where she perceives him as the baby. Yeah, the castrated person who's completely regulated by his obligation to this baby. And then he's going to look through here and the door closes. Oh no, everything is terrible. Our hero has reached his low point, which is supposed to happen in the middle of a script for a stereotypical adventure, (laughs) but no. This is not one of those, is it? It's going to happen right before he we reach the climax. Yes. And usually the climax for most adventures is, is not what's what's about to happen. What are you talking about? Don't you remember the end of uh, Lord of the Rings where Frodo mercilessly <laughs> strangles a baby to death? Just rips Gollum? its organ. I suppose Gollum is slightly a baby. Gollum kind of looks like the <laughs> baby. That's a good point. He does kind of look like Gollum. This is actually a very early role for Andy Serkis. Uh, <laughs> is playing the baby. In this movie that that plant by his his bed is actually doug jones too yes. <laughs> we need to stop doing doug jones movies god yeah and everything uh, they should both just get oscars immediately well this time it's not that doug jones it's the doug jones the congressperson from alabama <laughs> Boo. that one Ooh, alabama should replace their congressperson with the actual actor doug jones <laughs> Yeah, the real Doug Jones instead of that fake one. Yeah. No. Prefer Doug Jones to Roy Moore. (laughs) Wouldn't wouldn't we all? No, apparently. It's horrifying truth, but no. Not all of us, apparently. Kill the baby. (laughs) Kill the baby. Oh, man, I'm so ready for this. Uh, oh, he's going to do it. Oh, he's going to do it. Oh, there he goes. Well, I remember somebody bringing up the point of like, does he know he's killing the baby by doing this initially? I think he is 
it's kind of irrelevant whether or not he knows. Yeah. He wants to take action against it. And he's doing so violently with these scissors. And much in the same way that his fantasy allows him to like sort of cut through the the fabric that he's been trying to see through with his like own desires, him cutting through this whole, th- the baby is like as the embodiment of his desire is going to unleash everything hiding underneath. And actually in a certain sense, it's kind of, it's going to destroy the entire world. Him doing this. Yeah. Because the response is going to be an earthquake, right? And this is what sets up the final shots and moments of the movie. There it goes. Now, Max, can I ask you, the first time you watched this, what did you think was going to happen? I was not expecting that. I was expecting, like, a thing, because, like, it was more literal, but, like... Oh, God. I was expecting, like, a tiny him body, and, like, the baby's going to become him, like, because the baby keeps having the head, and it's going to replace him or something like that. I was not expecting him, like, it to just violently die immediately. Yeah, that's the really interesting thing about the morality of this movie at the end. It's not like this movie is saying that you should kill your children, but just the morality of the fact that he kills his. Yeah. And because it's the barrier to his, like, desire, in a certain sense, it's, like, weirdly, like... (laughs) Like... You get it. I'd kill this baby, too. Don't say that. I would kill the baby and erase her head. I am going on record saying that if that was my child i don't want to suffer it to live i'm sorry max don't you imagine if that thing grew up to be a teenager holy shit it's very handsome no it's not it's not at all it's disgusting and (laughs) i'm glad it's dead i'm very happy about it oh my god look at that oh that's gross yeah (laughs) oh man this is Casey Anthony's favorite movie. You're getting really feisty and political. <laughs> you know what? Topical. July 5th. I'm just going to talk about everyone I hate. At least have the courage to look at it. Dude. He has no courage at all. What's his entire character? You know what the alternative to this is? Is you could have just given it to Mary. <laughs> you know where she lives. Yeah, just drop it off on their front porch. Yeah. The worst they're going to do is cook it alongside one of their man-made chickens. Oh, (laughs) no. Oh, God. Maybe that's its missing body is one of those man-made chickens. That would have been funny. Hmm, that's interesting. Because those are the only... Because he also has to cut the chicken. Yeah. Those are the two times he cuts things in movies and they both explode awkwardly. Movie theory. Is the chickens and eraser head actually the body of the baby from eraser head? I love the giant, like, baby mouth that they make, too. <laughs> this reminds me of uh, the end of Evil Dead 2. Pumpkin head. Not that pumpkin head. But yes. The one from Evil Dead 2. That makes Ash's hair g- grow white. Oh, I'd love to see Ash fight this thing. <laughs> that should have been like Evil Dead. The next movie is he gets this weird deadite baby that's like the eraser head baby. Yeah, but you know, if they did that in a Evil Dead style, it would be dead alive. Except it probably would have been funnier. Yeah. Honestly. No, the baby in Dead Alive is the worst part of Dead Alive, but I'm saying. No! Definitely that scene where he beats the shit out of it. Well, yeah, that's that great. But I'm saying like every other thing the baby does yeah. in the movie is annoying. But here we go. Oh, here's the famous shot. Again, that beautiful... The cover photo. Particle lighting. The world is being destroyed. It seems that by destroying the baby, he has destroyed the entire fabric of this reality. And the planet is exploding. We're going to get a shot here soon of Jack Fisk once, once again trying to stop a lever from being pulled back. But he won't be able to. Of course, since we're going through another por- portal sort of object here, it's questionable whether or not this is some sort of fantasy anyway. Um, but yeah, there he goes. He's fighting against it. I think part of the other interesting thing about his casting is Jack Fisk that really reinforces the fact that he's kind of like the big other and in- or antagonist of this movie is that he is like, he is the production designer. Yeah. You know, he like designs the world of this movie. It's kind of maybe you could look at it as like meta casting in a weird way. 
Or is Jack Fisk what the baby would look like if he grew up because he had all of like the same? Maybe. Yeah. That, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know. But here we go. We're going to get our final shot here. And let me ask you, do you think this is, what do you think about this, the, this ending? Like in terms of the ambiguity of whether or not he succeeded or is it a good thing or a bad thing? What? Oh, I think I, I love the ambiguity. Per, personally, no, I don't think this is the kind of movie that has a happy ending. I think this is just like delirium in the moment of committing an atrocious act. And you're just like, no, everything will be fine when you inherently know it's not going to be okay. But that's my interpretation. But that's the great thing about this movie is it sparks so many conversations about what it means to you. And there is definitely a, like a correct answer for most of those, but hearing everybody's different little takes on the subtle little things is one of my favorite reasons to talk about this movie. Yeah. So thank you for suggesting this Austin. It was a yeah. very fun pick. And I, and I think, uh, in terms of my opinion on that ending, I think uh, I would agree. You could relate it to a number of different David Lynch endings, stuff like blue velvet, right? With the, you have the Robin, but again, it has that bug from the beginning in its mouth. Right. And it, it's this weird mixture of both the good and bad, and it's an, an, an acknowledgement of both. In this, it doesn't seem to acknowledge it as directly. However, um, I think it is more committed to some sort of like ontological change. I'm not sure that the ending is actually like a pure fantasy because you do see the Jack Fisk character really struggling to hold that lever up. Yeah. And I think that's like a real indication that maybe something has changed. At any rate, he committed some really like dramatic acts that demonstrate his agency at the end of the movie. And that's a clearly a big change. Although like, again, Lynch's other movies, I'm not so sure it's entirely good or unambiguous. So yeah, this has been Eraserhead. Do you have any final thoughts on it really? Or, uh, the cold medicine is wearing off. So I'm delirious and sick now rather than just Perfect. delirious. You're going to look like so, that baby in about five minutes. Yes. Um, hopefully in he when I die in heaven, everything is fine. Yeah. So, so yes, this has been a racer head. Uh, as always, I just want to remind everybody our episodes are not the final world. So we know that with this movie that, uh, this is just one interpretation of it. You can have whatever interpretation you like, but this is sort of how we go about making sense of it for ourselves. We'd love to hear from you, and if you want to tell us how wrong we are and we missed some of the best symbolism in this movie, I'd love to hear that. If you agree with us, that's cool. Or if you just want to check out some of our other episodes, we're available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. Oh, Sissy Spacek in the credits. There you go. our website, spectatorfilmpodcast.com. You know, Sissy Spacek would go on to work with David Lynch in The Straight Story. I'm more interested in the gay story than I am the straight story. But Cool. Bye, everyone.